So this is probably going to be a really short one. Today we are going to talk about camera reports, which is, although a very, very annoying part of being a camera assistant, a very important one. They're especially important on larger productions where you're working over multiple months, days, weeks, whatever it might be, and also on productions where you're going to have a lot more special effects involved, so a lot more post-production. Basically they're used to keep track of all of the camera's settings when you're shooting, so that you know that A, if you have to do any post-production work on them, you know exactly what was used to get that shot, including filters, lens size, uh, distance from subject, etc, etc. Or B, you're able to recreate it if you need to go back to a scene or you need to redo certain shots, which will often be the case because on such long form productions, you'll be jumping back and forth between one scene and another scene and then you'll go back to that scene again three weeks later and you'll have, want to remember what you'd done the first time to make sure it matches. So yeah, I mean, they're, they're super important, but they are really annoying to fill out. And if you don't know how to fill them out the first time, it can be a little bit daunting to get all of the information. So let's have a look at this example here. Now there's a big section at the top. It usually has the information about the production. So the production name, the production company, contact details, things like that. And then you've got the date, the page number, You'll need to know how many pages were used that day. So you'll have page one of 10, two of 10, whatever. And then underneath that, you'll have details about who is on set, who is on the crew. So you've got the director's name, and then you've also got the director of photography, and then the operator, if there is one. And then you'll also have the camera details. So you'll have what camera it is, A camera, B camera, C camera and then you'll have the roll number or the mag number. Now there was a comment in a previous video that I did about camera assisting and somebody was talking about what you would call a card because now that we're using mostly digital, it is a card. You do still actually most of the time call them mags and that comes from magazine, obviously, when we were using film predominantly. It was a film magazine that you loaded, so that is where that comes from and it's still kind of used today so that's how that came about. Now we're going to look at underneath all of that information which is where all the nitty-gritty information is put in. Just take note with this one that the layout that you see on your camera sheets or your camera reports on set might be a little bit different to what I've got here. That's normal. Everybody kind of has their own way, their own layout of doing it and because you know obviously you guys are overseas, I'm in Australia, things are a little bit different and then each production can be a little bit different as well. So just be aware of that, but we're gonna go ahead with the example I've got here and this will give you an idea about what you're actually meant to put in there or information that you can put in there and how to kind of lay it out. And the key is to just lay it out neatly, but yeah, this will give you some idea and then you can kind of work it out for yourself when you do a couple of productions. Trust me, it may seem daunting, but it actually really is quite simple to get a handle of and it is something that you'll gradually get quicker at over time. So there are four columns in my example. You have the scene, the take, the print. Now print is whether it was a good take or not, which one you're going to print. That also comes from film days when it might have been a little bit difficult to tell us any all of it and you might need to pick and choose which ones were going to be tell us any. So that's where that comes from. It's kind of fallen out of use, but it's a thing. It can still be used and it does still get use sometimes. And then next to that, you got the information. So all of the camera information that you'll need to put in there. Very self-explanatory. This is the way that I would lay it out. So I would start in a red pen. Really good tip here is to have a four pen or a four colored pen so you can flip between colors. That just makes it really easy to read for you and for other people unless you're doing the transfer forms, in which case it makes it easier for you to read and everybody else just has to deal with what they dealt. But anyway, you will list the scene at the top of that page or wherever you're starting on the page. You have the scene number, and then next to that, just put in the information that are basic across the whole scene. So typically your ISO and your white balance will stay the same for the whole scene. Sometimes it'll change, we'll get to that later. Underneath that, we can start to list our shots. So start with A, B, C, whatever you're doing, and then your take numbers next to that. And if one is a good take and you definitely know that that's gonna be good, you can put a P next to that. If you're instructed to put print next to that, you can do that. I've seen people also put 
time code in there as well. So they've taken note of specific time grabs that are good to print. That's very rare though, because it is kind of hard to keep track of that sort of thing when you're running around and doing everything else as well. Okay, the nitty gritty information, here we go. I actually, I came up with a way to remember it. It's probably, it's just a thing in my mind that stuck in my mind and helped me remember what to put in, what information to put into that information column when I'm talking about camera settings. And it was L-I-F-F, -F. that is lens, iris, focus, filters. So you can see in my example here, we've got a lens that's 35 millimeters and it's at T2, which is your aperture, your iris, and then 13 foot, that will denote how far away the action is, what the focal distance is. And then after that, you've got the filters. So ND filters, Promists, which is in my example there, but could be anything. Now, what do you do if you're going for multiple takes and it's got exactly the same information? Will you just write it all out again? Hell no, you ain't got time for that. It is perfectly acceptable to put little parentheses in there to just make sure that people understand that that information from the first take is carried across to the second. If anything does change, you can make an alteration there, but anything that is the same, you can just put the little... Okay, so what if it's a zoom lens? What do you do then? Well, you distinctly mark what sort of zoom lens it is, because if you have multiple zooms on set, it may be one focal length or another focal length. So let's just say it's the 28 to 70, whatever this zoom is. But we need to make sure we tell people what focal length we were at on that zoom. So you just go 28 to 70, denote that it's a zoom with a Z next to that, and then at 40 or at 50 or at 70, whatever it might be, you pop it there. And then continue as normal. So you put your T-stop in there, you put the focal distance in there. If the focus is changing throughout the shot, so let's just say that somebody is walking towards camera and that's a very distinct motion towards camera, you will get the mark that it starts on and then the mark that it ends on and pop them both in. Make it kind of a range, if you will. Now, if anything does change from the scene settings that you've written at the top, you can add that further down in whichever shot it changed in. And you can make it really clear by popping it in red like you did with the scene information so that people can understand. Now, if you're working on a film that is long form, so a feature or a TV drama or, or something of the like, you may be given a camera report booklet which has transfers in there, carbon transfers. Now those carbon transfers um, can go off to different places so you will need to check with somebody on the team if it's your first time doing it just double check with a camera assistant on the team about where they go. Now you may think as a second AC you have next to no time to do something like this and believe me it can be hard sometimes but look you will be able to find time to do this. The details are so easy to find and you can do that with little effort. When you've got that downtime where things are still being set up but they're almost ready to go, that's about the point where you can duck around the camera and get all the information you need. Now, off the top of your head, you, you should know what focal length is on the camera because you should have assisted the first AC in changing that lens. So that's all good. You know what focal length's on there. Great, you can write that down. To get a stop, wait until the last minute because sometimes things can change fairly quickly. Now you can do this immediately after a shot is done and just quickly jot down all the information when you go up to the camera in between takes, but it's easier to kind of get it done as close as you can to the take beginning. That includes the distance as well, the focal distance and any filters. Now you, you should know filters off the top of your head as well. So you see most of this information should be common knowledge to you because you yourself were involved in actually putting those filters in, actually changing that lens, and actually changing those settings, sometimes. So that is how to fill out a camera report. It's very basic. Trust me, you'll pick it up so quickly. Don't feel daunted by the amount of information that you have to remember. Just remember L-I-F-F. -F. That's how I remembered it. I know it's weird, but it worked for me. So I hope it works for you. Okay, so question of the day. Well, if you guys don't know, I'm doing little questions at the end of each video. So if you have a question, leave it down below. You can also tweet me at Felicia Cine, or you can send me a little message on Instagram or comment on any of my posts. 
just make sure you put a Q in front of your question so that I know it is for the Q&A. So today's question comes from Alex Wachowski. Oh my gosh, I hope I got your name correct. I'm so sorry if I didn't. And Alex is asking, how were you able to get your foot in the door to the industry? And when did you decide that film slash TV was something that you wanted to do? Which is an interesting question. How was I able to get my foot inside the door of this industry? It was really hard and it took a long time to get anywhere. I'm, I'm still trying to get somewhere. That's how difficult it is. I was working as a camera assistant for five years before deciding to make the jump to DP. Now, some people take a lot longer in camera assisting to move up, but because I saw other people making that leap and they were doing it all at around the same time and I was starting to pick up more camera work, I decided to make that jump. I was actually doing really well as a camera assistant. I was having a lot of fun doing it and I love assisting, which is why I like making these videos because I like teaching you guys about quite possibly the coolest job I've ever had. But it really was time to move on. So that's why I moved up into cinematography and that is a whole other ballpark. I had to find new people to work with because a lot of people still thought I was a camera assistant and luckily I found people who can use me as a DP and those people who knew me as a camera assistant are now starting to see that I can actually shoot as well. So that's great, but it takes a really long time and it's so hard. But in terms of getting my foot in the door to begin with, I've got to say it's all down to luck, really. I was in the right place at the right time and I managed to land a job in equipment rentals, which is a job that I highly recommend for people who are wanting to get into the camera department because you just get to play with all of this awesome kit and you get so much technical knowledge from that. And on top of that, you get to communicate with other camera assistants who come in for gear checks and that's really valuable. And that's how my camera assisting career kind of started. I got that job, I got to communicate and talk to lots of ACs who came in the door to do their own gear checks and then I got to know them and got to work with them which is awesome but that was all luck I just managed to approach this company at the right time and I got a job so keep trying it's really hard it can be really disheartening at times but you've just got to keep going and when did I decide that film was the right thing for me I decided really young actually I always liked visual roles. I always liked photography, art, film. It, it was all very interesting to me. And I think it kind of hit me when I was doing work experience in high school and I really, really wanted to do something film related. But the careers counsellor didn't really have any idea about where to put me. She was like, oh, just go to an office. Oh, just, you know, do something boring. I didn't want to do that. So I spoke to my dad and I said, Dad, I want to do something that's film related. So Dad and I went out and we found a place or a bunch of places. We approached them and then one place, one post-production house said yes. And that was the best moment because I got to basically say in your face to the careers counsellor and go and do something fun for a week. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this video today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please remember to give it a big fat thumbs up. And if you would like to see more of my face and learn a little bit more about filmmaking in the process, Remember to subscribe and I'll see you later.